So I'm going to tell you about the use of automated decisions inside like AI systems that are use, uh, or automated decision makers and how people are starting to pay attention to making those decisions in a fair and responsible way. So as a motivation, this is uh, something that started us off in this research topic where we said, you know, some people uh, these days with online advertising, uh, your ads get chosen based on what people think that you're interested in, what the companies think you're interested in, and so you know somebody uh, could feel jealous that their friend was shown this vacation spot as an ad and you weren't shown that. Okay, so the question is why wasn't I shown this ad? Um, and I, what I think about it is decision making. All these areas that were used to decisions being made in are now becoming more and more automated. So. Uh, you can ask the same question about, you know, why wasn't I shown this ad? You could say, why was I given, you know, this horrible insurance rate? Or why didn't, you know, was I didn't get into schools? Or, you know, got some very bad health care rates in the U.S. is a problem. Um, you know, questions about financial aid and banking. Or, you know, why was my paper not accepted? And questions like that. Um, and... These days, with the proliferation of online systems, a lot of these decisions are being made in an automated way. And so that's really the motivation for this, is the question about how can we make these automated decisions in all these different areas in a, in a way that's, that's fair. Um, so, for instance, like, you know, with health insurance in the U.S., they do this pre-screening based on things like your browsing history and other, other aspects like that to decide, um, you know, what kind of uh, healthcare rates to give you. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to be talking about is how to do this in a fair way. And a, a lot of the question comes down to what does fair mean? Okay, so that's going to be a focus of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and so what I showed you was online advertising as the example. And so the way I'm going to set up the problem is where you want to be fair against some protected group. And we aren't going to say what the protected group is in different settings, it's different kinds of groups, but typically it's some sort of minority defined, an ethnic minority, religious, medical, geographic, whatever it might be. And supposedly they're protected by law or by policy or by ethics, but a lot of those protections are difficult to enforce. And so the question is, the overly, uh, overlying question about all this is if we can't completely control the data, can we regulate how it's used and how decisions are made based on it? And some motivation for this. Uh, so an example is uh, just like online advertising, but it can be for credit card offers. For example, there was a case where certain minority groups were being steered into credit card offers that w where the interest rates were much higher. Um, and it's not that this is a new problem. So this is a, a map of Philadelphia, I think from the 50s or 60s, that was an example of what's called redlining. <clears throat> where here, the idea was that the houses and businesses that are in red weren't able to get um, loans or mortgages. And it turns out that these were the mostly uh, black areas of town. And even they didn't go at a socioeconomic way, like some of them were more affluent than others. But these were all the black areas, and in particular, red areas really were denied services, like mortgages and loans. And the term redlining came into uh, uh, use at that time. Right? So, <clears throat> so this is an example where I'm going to come back to it, where a user visits something like uh, Capital One, they want to get a credit card, and the company uses another company that does this tracking data on a user and gets the information about a user from the tracking data, and based on the tracking data, decides what kind of credit card offer to give them. Okay, so that's the way it works. So there's two companies involved. There's Capital One, and then there's the actual company that gets tracking data and learns about the individual and gives that information to the credit card company. So we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so there's other kinds of discrimination I want to mention. Uh, that there's another one that's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there's been some cases in the states in particular where a company was told they had to give out some favorable rates or some things to uh, minority groups. And it was found that they were chosen, they chose individuals who they knew were going to default on the loan, for example. 
And so they call it a self-fulfilling prophecy because later they could use that to justify the bias against that group in the future. Okay, so there's lots of examples like this of different forms that discrimination can take in. And so what I'm interested in is how algorithms that we're developing, so machine learning algorithms that are really based on historical data, how those often perpetuate a lot of the biases that are already in the historical data. Right? So the question is how could you use uh, machine learning systems and overcome some of the biases that are in the historical data. So things like the redlining meant that a lot of the minorities weren't getting mortgages, they weren't getting loans. And so if you just built a machine learning system that looked at that data and just made the same kind of decisions that were made in the past, the same kind of people would be denied the loans in the future. Okay, so we want to overcome those kinds of historical biases. Okay. And sometimes this bias is quite subtle. So this was something that was done a few years ago. I think you could try it again on your own computer where you could do a search in uh, Google for, when I mean, you type in CEO under Google Images and you get all these images here. And there's one dominating thing you'll notice, right? So there's no women, okay? And it turns out that at the time there was a quote that there were roughly 27% of the, uh, in the US of the uh, women were CEOs, but certainly not 27% of the Google images are, uh, are women. Uh, but if you look in the bottom corner here on the right, there is one woman that shows up, and it's this one. Right. <laughs> so, so this really is a bias that's just perpetuated. Again, it's a machine learning system that's just trained on the web. People do searches, and they encode the results of the searches. So if somebody did a search for a CEO, and they clicked on a male, then that image would get uh, uh, higher ranked, and would tend to show up the next time somebody does a search for CEO. And so those are just automated algorithms that are perpetuating biases that are in the system. Okay. So back to online advertising. Someone did a study a few years ago where they said, where Google is quite sensitive to this. So Google was worried that they were going to be, people were saying that you know, their online advertising was discriminatory. And so they built something called ad settings where the person could, could change their profile to try to shape the kind of ads that they were being shown to Google. All right, and so with them what they did is th these people did a study uh, where they simulated different user profiles and then they wanted to see how those profiles were reflected in the kinds of ads that they were actually shown. And the question is, could, these, could the profile shaping actually be effective at changing the ads and making them less discriminatory or biased? And they said that it, it still didn't have the right effect. So, uh, so if their user profile looked like a man, then they saw more ads for executive level positions. And women got more ads for job hunting uh, positions. Um, and if you browsed for something like substance abuse, then you were shown uh, ads for things like drug and rehab services. Right? So it was directly based on your browsing history. And even the settings that Google was making available to people weren't able to overcome a lot of this. And that's just because ad selection really is based on lots of things. It's not just the profile. You know, what's the relevance, like the same thing with the clicking on the, the uh, images. Google determines the kind of relevance of any given ad. Uh, advertisers target, and Google has to be sensitive to that in order to make money. Um, and it depends on the user's actions, like what web pages did they view, and how long did they stay on a web page. All those things factor into the kind of ads that somebody shows. Right. So, there's lots of issues that come up in general when learning algorithms are used to make decisions. Uh, and in general, this has been largely ignored by the machine learning community until, until very recently. So here is an example of a couple years ago, an algorithm found an optimal employee by studying lots of records and said, okay, what was, what was the most successful employee and it found that it's one that lives near the job, has reliable transportation, and uses one to four social networks. Okay, so this is the kind of thing, they get this profile and they decide this is the right person to hire. Um, and a lot of this came into uh, challenge, it came, uh, there were challenges brought up in courts to say that the al even if an algorithm is making that decision, the company's liable for an algorithm making any kind of discriminatory decision. 
and this, that's true for hiring decisions and also for lending decisions. This one's kind of long, I won't read the whole thing, but the idea is that uh, lenders can't discriminate against loan applicants on the basis of any of these things. But if you have software algorithms that are working on their own and learning as they go, they can very well be sensitive to all of these issues, race and religion. It's all kind of under the hood, and the question is, how can you make the algorithm responsible for the decisions it makes? And legally, there's something that's been established in the US called the law of disparate impact. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but the idea there is there's a well-established legal doctrine that says this, that a company is liable if what it practices has a disproportionate adverse impact on individuals based on any of these things, race, age, gender, or other protected characteristics. Um, so it sounds good. It's a little bit difficult to define. What's a disproportionate adverse impact? Right? So that's where the law, law, uh, lawyers get involved. Um, but the point is, is that the company is liable even if it unknowingly discriminates. And this has been true for many years. This has been true, like back in the 70s, there was a case where the company was found they couldn't require an intelligence test or a high school diploma in their hiring decisions. That was deemed to be discriminatory uh, and having an, a, a disproportionate adverse impact on some people. So a lot of this stuff has happened recently and the governments are becoming more and more aware. Um, so the government in the, in the US, uh, the Federal Trade Commission charged that the home mortgage company had failed to, re this is in a recent case, that they failed to monitor, examine, analyze loan prices right, that were charged to African American and Hispanic applicants. So this was an example of the law of disparate impact. And then the leaders of countries, so when Obama was president, he started a council of he had a council of economic advisors that did a big study on big data. And they published a great, I recommend the report. It did a great report showing that big data, one of this is a quote I just pulled out of it, um, it could lead to disparate impact by providing sellers with more variables to choose from, some of which will be correlated with membership in a protected class. So this is the same kind of idea we were seeing before, that there's these things like race and religion Right, so some sort of protected class, and even if they aren't paying specific attention to those, there's going to be other variables that, that the algorithm can be sensitive to will end up being uh, indirectly sensitive to race and religion. Okay. So that was a, a something that they published in Europe uh, that was passed, well, I think it was about a year and a half ago, and it's supposed to come into effect this year, in 2018. The European Union, Union passed what's called the Data Protection Regulation. And that says when personal data is collected, it shouldn't be processed in a way that's incompatible with its original purposes. And this is again meant to say that things have to be done fairly. That is, if there's data about somebody's personal data, like their race and religion, and other things that come up in a census or something else, that that can't be used for making decisions about the individual. Okay. So that's all meant to be kind of background and motivation for what I wanted to talk about, what we can do in machine learning. All right, so the question, these are the challenges. It's a difficult problem, and the question is what can we do? So my personal story on this is about five years ago, I think. Uh, I went with um, and spent the summer at Microsoft Research in California, and there was a group there who's been known, famous for their work in differential privacy which is different than fairness. So privacy is about you know, keeping personal identification, personal information out of decision making. Um, and so this group was very well known for def uh, defining what was called differential privacy, this method for maintaining privacy that's now become very popular. So it's pop the companies like Apple and Google are actually using it in practice. So we had discussions though, because privacy is one problem, that's keeping the personal information about somebody you know, private and not being used. Uh, fairness is a different dimension. So fairness is really about you know, uh, not the individual as a whole, but some aspect of the individual not being used to discriminate against it, like you know, their race or religion and things like that. So I think about it, a uh, way to think about it in a kind of data uh, direction is if you think about it, you have a row and some matrix or array for every individual. Okay, so it's you, and then there's every column describes some aspect of you. Your race, your religion, your age, all these things you might fill out. 
in uh, some uh, survey. Um, and so, and privacy is really about protecting the whole row. It's saying we don't want to let this person's information to be let out, period. And fairness is about the columns. It's saying we want to protect a particular column, like the race or the religion. Okay, so they're kind of complementary problems. And nobody had really considered fairness very much. And so we spent the whole summer debating of what it meant to be fair. <laughs> and had a lot of arguments about defining it. Um, and we came up with this general framework. So this is how we formulated the problem, which was in terms of the um, idea is that there's individuals, these little colorful people here, uh, and we can call those points in some x space. So x would be some vector, some you know all the columns I was describing, right? Your race, religion, all those other things. So everybody's a point in this space. And ultimately, we want to make some decision. Like, you know, is this person going to get a loan? Or is this person going to get into some school? All right, so that's why. That's the decision that's being made. But there's a whole bunch of processing that goes on between those two. And so this is the original interpretation of the person. And this is the vendor action. Like, you know, do they, what credit card offer are they going to get? Okay. And so our idea was to split the problem into two and say that, just like I talked about with the Capital One case, right? So Capital One could be the vendor making the decision about the credit card, but there actually is this tracking company out there that's coming up with a representation of the individual that they give to Capital One, and then Capital One makes the decision about that person. Right? So we split the problem into two. We said, well, first we want to come up with a representation for the individual, and then give that representation to the vendor. So if we're going to be fair, fairness is going to come into this first part. That's kind of where society can come in and impose its will and say, we want these representations to be fair in some way. And then it ships them off to the vendor, and the vendor can make whatever decisions it wants. And as long as this first part ensures that there's fairness in the representation of the individuals, then the vendor's decisions will be fair. All right? So that's our setup of the problem is this two-stage thing where we're going to try to make this first stage fair so that the vendor doesn't have to worry about fairness because we've already guaranteed it in this first stage. So as I said, the goal is to achieve fairness in what we call the representation step. We're going to map individuals to some representation Z. Okay. And we're going to assume that there's some unknown, untrusted, unauditable vendor on the other end. Okay. And so we're protecting against the bad guys here. And so this is meant to be like some ad network originally was doing this that was doing the tracking, but now it has some society oversight. So this is where the society gets to come in and, and impose some restrictions on this. Okay. So, um, so for example, just to make this concrete, uh, the vendor might be trying to sell potato chips or something, or you know, give out coupons for low-fat potato chips. And so what's the representation? The representation should be, is this person a likely kind of person to be interested in low-fat products? Right? So it's like all the stuff about your browsing history, maybe what you've bought, is an indication of how, you know, how much you care about buying low how likely you are to buy low-fat things, so that then the vendor will know whether to market low-fat stuff to you. So that's just a concrete example of how this could be done in a way. And then the question is, can we say whether somebody is likely to buy low-fat uh, products without giving away important information about these protected attributes, whether it's gender or race or whatever it is we're trying to protect against? So one thought would be, maybe we could just get rid of that column, right? The race and, or the religion or whatever it is we're trying to protect against. Why don't we just remove that information? Okay? Does anybody see a problem with that? Yeah? A lot of variables are correlated with the protected. Right, exactly. So we called it fairness versus S blindness. So we're using S as the sensitive variable, like let's say it's race or religion or whatever. And so you can remove it or ignore this membership in S or not. S, S equals 1 means that you're, you belong to the protected group. S equals 0 is you don't. But as you said, it's correlated with lots of other attributes. So membership in S can be encoded in a lot of other attributes. So this is our illustration of that. You can be 
Ideally, you could be fair by being blind, you know, putting blinders on justice, but it doesn't quite work. Okay? And more generally, it's very hard to anonymize data. So this is another, just like about the correlations in, uh, in terms of the underlying variables. So this is a famous case um, of someone named Latanya Sweeney, uh, who showed that there was an example where the uh, Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission uh, released some anonymized data to include the state employee's hospital visits. Uh, and they removed all this other information. Okay, thinking, okay, now we've anonymized it, we've removed this information, it's all clean. But this person showed that uh, no, you can often correlate that information that's in that database with some other database, like a census database. So that's what she did. She took a census database and said, based on the information that was in the release data and some census data, she put the two together and was able to find the governor's health records himself, of his, his own health records in this, in this data. Figure out which individual was the governor and all the hospital visits, all the medicine, everything else that the governor had. Um, and more generally showed that 87% of African Americans were identifiable based only on their zip code, birth date, and gender. So this is just the general idea that it's very hard to anonymize data. So this concept that we want to do, we want to take the data and remove information about it. It's a very challenging problem, okay, because often you can go and recover all that information anyways. Okay. <coughs> so. And about six years ago now, we published a paper we called Fairness Through Awareness. And the idea in that was, as I said, we spent the whole summer arguing about definitions. And so we came up with two definitions for what it meant to be fair. And one we called individual fairness. And that says that individuals who are similar should be treated similarly. And that is even if I'm, you know, if I'm trying to be sensitive about gender, right? A woman who's very sim similar to me should be treated very much the same as I am. And a man who's similar to me should be treated similarly. Okay, so that's a one concept of fairness. Um, so the second concept is what we call group fairness. And that is been the focus, because individual fairness is very hard to define because you have to say, what does it mean that the individuals are similar? Right? So that's a whole nother question. Group fairness says, well, let's just look at it in terms of the people who belong to the group and the people who don't. So S plus are the people where S equals one, that means they belong to the sensitive group. S minus, they don't belong to the sensitive or protected group. And so a simple idea is what we call statistical or demographic parity. And that is that the two groups should be equal in terms of the outcomes, all right? So in other words, you could say that if you could choose some number like 70% and say that if 70% of the S plus people get the loan, then 70% of the S minus people should get the loan too. So that's typically what statistical or demographic parity means. The, the two groups get treated the same way in terms of the outcomes. For us, we refined that a little bit because we said, well, again, remember we're dividing it up into two stages. We aren't necessarily dealing with the classification problem about whether you're getting the loan or not. We're dealing with the representation problem, which is the representation of what your Z value is, right? So we're taking you, every individual, and representing them as some point in Z space. And the idea would be that those the Z representation should be the same between the two groups. And another way of saying that in mathematical terms would be the probability that Z equals some value K, given that you belong to the protected group, is the same probability that Z equals K if you don't belong to the protected group. So they're equalized, right? So if that's the case, then the vendor is making decisions based on Z, and it can't tell the difference between S equals zero and S equals one, it has to be fair, okay? So that's the idea of statistical or demographic parity. So similar individuals are now mapped, or individuals are mapped so that you've lost information about which group they belong to. <clears throat> and it's fairness through awareness because this mapping can be done in a, uh, that's our little picture of awareness, because now you know which group they belong to. And, and therefore, you do a different mapping to the Z from X for the S equals 0 and S equals 1, and you make sure that they lose the information about the S. Okay, so that's the awareness part of it. You're aware when then you're defining this mapping 
so that you come up with a fair representation for the individuals. Okay. So let me just go through this and explain that we then followed it up with another paper the following year, which was a little more complicated, but the basic idea was that we want to learn some representation that obfuscates, removes information about the sensitive variables S, and it has a few goals. We want to retain as much information as possible about the individual, about X. So as we said, we have this really rich representation of you and your browsing history and what you bought and where you've gone and everything. And we can't remove all of that information because then the vendor would never buy into the system. Right? The vendor wants to have enough information to do a good job of marketing to you. Uh, but we want to lose information about S. Right? We want to make sure that it's fair in the sense that you've lost information about the sensitive variable. And in general, we want to preserve the information for classification so the vendor can maximize their utility. All right, so there's a rep And all of this can be formalized in terms of statistical or information theoretic ideas about mutual information. We want to maximize the information that Z has about the original X, but minimize the information that Z has about S and maximize the information that Z has about Y. Okay, so it's this dual or triple objective in this case where we want to maintain information about the original input and about the classification while removing information about the sensitive variable. <coughs> and then we decide to do some experiments. So one thing in this area is it's very hard. In machine learning system, it's often you want to take some data and try out some algorithms and see how they work. Right? So that's kind of the fun of the, of the problem sometimes. So you spend a bunch of time defining an algorithm, and then you run it on some test data and see what happens. Right? So in our case, what we did is we took some test data, three different kinds of uh, sample problems. So one is an old data set called the German credit data set. And this is, I think, from the 70s or 60s, maybe, where you wanted to, this is like records of people in Germany from a particular bank, and they were deemed whether they were good credit or bad credit. Okay, it was useful to decide whether they were going to get a loan or not. And so we want to classify the individual as a good credit or a bad credit risk. Uh, and what we did is we defined a sensitive variable called age. We just, so we had age was one of the, in the uh, <coughs> features we had about every person. <coughs> we said, imagine we created it as a fairness problem. We said that imagine what we want to do is make a decision about somebody being a good or bad credit risk, but we want to remove the information about age. Because it turned out that age was a really important variable. They weren't, in, in this case, they were very sensitive to age and they weren't giving young people, they were assigning young people as being bad credit risks. Okay? So this, uh, and then there was another data set, the adult income data set. Again, this is another one where they wanted to predict whether somebody has a high annual income that could also be useful for deciding on loans or other things. And the sensitive feature we chose in that case was gender, right? Because gender it turned out to be women at this in this older data set had, had lower annual incomes. Right? So we have all these different instances, like 45,000 instances, and, and identified 14 attributes for every instance. Uh, and the last one was the largest data set with 147,000 instances. And this was something that was a competition that was put online by it's called the Heritage Health Foundation. It was a we think it was being used. For, for an HMO in the States, where they were trying to decide how, the aim was to predict how many days someone, a newly admitted patient, they were doing triage at a, a hospital, when this person, how many days was that person going to spend in the hospital? All right, and you can see how an HMO might decide to change coverage decisions based on this, potentially. So we decided to make this into a problem where the sensitive feature was age. So obviously, older people by and large, will spend longer at the, tend to spend longer at the hospital. Then you can imagine you want to build a system that doesn't discriminate on the basis of age. So the discriminatory decision here, so this is the prediction problem, which is are they going to spend some nights in the hospital? And behind the scenes, that could, you could see how that could lead to a potentially discriminatory decision about whether that person gets denied or uh, credit or not, or denied coverage by the health uh, organization. So just to give you a flavor, I won't go into details about this, but you know there were some some other methods that people had decide, had developed. We found out as we were publishing this paper <laughs> in a very different community. 
uh, it's called the data mining community, that people had worked on some of this discrimination aware classification. And they had other approaches that weren't about this idea of coming up with an intermediate representation. They were just trying to make the decisions be fair, like using things like I mentioned, demographic or statistical parity, which would say, you know, 70% of the white people should get the loan as the as you know the minorities say. Um, and so we compared on things like accurate. So the aim is you're trading off these things. You're trading off accuracy. That is, you hold out so the way it works is you hold out some data and you predict. You know, for the German one, were they going to get the loan or not? I think that's what it was. You know, were they going to get, are they a good credit risk or not? And so you want it to be accurate as possible with respect to that data. That's what the vendor wants to do. And yet you want to discriminate as little as possible. And discrimination here was measured as the difference in the decisions between the two groups. Okay, that's the statistical or demographic period. And so ours was this purple one where we were, you know, almost as accurate as these others, but we're less discriminatory. Okay? And this is for the different data sets. This is the adult data set. We were just almost as accurate as the most, as this one. So the yellow one is a, is a classifier that's making a decision completely ignoring the fact that it wants to be fair. Right? So this is your standard machine learning system. It's a good baseline. It says we're just going to try and be as accurate as possible. And it doesn't care about fairness. And then you can measure, well, how discriminatory was it? Okay. And you can see that the, it's hard to get it correct in this case. You don't have that much data. So the test data, you're going to get like 80% accuracy here. And so we're able to get like 78% accuracy and get rid of the discrimination. So that's work we had done a while ago. Then we, we extended that to learning a more complicated, richer representation. The original work had a very low dimensional, simple representation where we lost a lot of the information. So then we used uh, some other methods. Maybe I won't go into the details about it, but the idea is to, so you can now just, just think abstractly. So this is the kind of space, the Z space that we're representing individuals in. And this is the, the now it's a high dimensional space, but it's being mapped down to two dimensions. Okay, so every point in here is an individual that's being represented in two dimensions. It's actually more like 50 dimensional, but it's being represented here and compressed, projected down into two dimensions. And what you see here, the purple dots are the S equals zero group. That's the, the non-minority group. And the red is the minority group, S equals one. And you can see that the system that's trained on based on accuracy, there's a fair separation between the red and the purple. Right? So you can kind of tell the people apart. And the idea is that when we have this fairness criteria that says we want to remove the information about S, we end up with a representation that looks like this. So the two groups kind of lie on top of each other. All right? so, that, um, so that the vendor now is making a decision, it won't be able to have information about S in that decision because these groups lie on top of each other. <coughs> okay? We had a paper on that a couple years ago, how to do this in this higher dimensional space and what we got out of it is a much uh, a deep network uh, where we were able to you know lose a little bit in accuracy but gain a lot in terms of removing discrimination. Okay. So so now we're gonna move just to more recent times. So this is a couple of years ago and things have really changed in the last few years. So changed in a, in a number of ways. One is that this has become the, the prevalence of machine learning systems in these automated decisions has become you know, all over the news. Um, so there's a famous case uh, <clears throat> that was put out by a company called uh, uh, Compass, where Compass developed a system that tried to predict recidivism. That is, is a person uh, who's committed a crime before likely to reoffend, likely to commit another. Uh, in this case, it was what's the probability they're going to commit another violent crime in the next three years? Right? And so then this group called ProPublica, which was kind of like a think of it like a oversight group that was you know trying to see what was going on, and they examined the scores for that is the risk of reoffending scores for about 10,000 people. In, that were charged with a crime in Florida that were then run through this compass scoring system where they were assigned the probability of, a, of a committing another crime. 
And then they looked, they followed up and said how many of those, they looked at the predictions against how many were actually charged with the crime within the next two years. Okay. So that is, how good a predictor was this compass system? And what they found was that black defendants were twice as likely to be incorrectly labeled as high risk. Okay, so they had this particular case where uh, I think she, yeah, she took a kid's bike and scooter that were sitting outside, uh, this woman, and was assigned a high risk of eight. And this guy had committed a bunch of violent crimes. Uh, but he was given the low risk of three, and he did commit a violent crime afterwards, and she did. Right? So there was like these public cases where it became very well known that there was this apparent racial bias in the system, and the the scary thing is that these are actually being used in real systems. So this prediction by this compass system is being used in the courts. Uh, I went to a workshop about a year and a half ago in Washington where it was a data and civil rights workshop with uh, using uh, algorithm, the use of algorithms in the courts, where this kind of thing was really, uh, uh, a lot of people were talking about this and paying attention to it. I met somebody who works in Pennsylvania for the courts, and she worked on a system that for every individual that is being considered for bail or for sentencing, they run it through their system and it produces a probability that they're going to commit another violent crime within the next three years. It comes up with a probability between zero and one. And the judge sees this number and it factors into the judge's decision. It's up to the judge how he or she uses it, but it factors into the judge's decision. But then you talk to them about how they build this system and how they test it, and it's really a bit scary because it's very hard to, A, to build a system that is reliable and to validate it. Right? So the question is, they don't have that much data available about the people, so the decisions that are being made about the probability that they're going to commit another violent crime is based on very little data about the individual. And the kinds of decisions that it's made, they don't, haven't had it running for a number of years where they can really validate it and say that, you know, if it said probability 0.9, how often did the person really commit another violent crime? And it was this kind of study that showed that maybe these systems aren't that good, right? That they're, uh, that they have some built-in problems. So not, it's not clear that the problems are clearly racial, but the prob there are a lot of problems in terms of their reliability and how they predict okay. So let me just tell you what's happening in the machine learning world these days is that, you know, uh, I gave a talk about this at a machine learning conference and I can tell you it wasn't like the most popular talk I've given. <laughs> not many people care. Um, but it's, things have changed. Uh, it used to be like one of our main conferences is called NIPS. It just happened this last December. Typically, there'd be like one or two or maybe three papers a year. This year, there were 20 papers on fairness. There was an invited talk uh, by someone named Kate Crawford. I recommend, she's, uh, I recommend you looking up that talk, Kate Crawford at NIPS, if you're interested in that. And there was a tutorial talking about the machine learning work that's been going on uh, in fairness. So fairness has become a... Uh, at least a hot, if not a hot topic, a hotter topic at machine learning. There's even a, we have, there's even our own conference called uh, called used to be called Fat ML, uh, which is Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency. Uh, and that's a conference that brings together researchers and practitioners of, uh, interested in these topics and socio-technical systems. And so I've been talking mostly about fairness. Accountability is more like you know a system makes a decision. You want to hold it accountable? Can it ex explain why? It's related to the explainability point. Is it ex understandable? And that's the transparency too. Is it understandable how it works, how it makes its decisions? Okay. <clears throat> so, so we have two recent bits of work I want to finish with. Just telling you, so uh, my research group here that we've been working on in fairness. Two more recent things, and. Uh, one of them is about, uh, so something I mentioned before, which is in a real world system, that's not the decision making isn't done ultimately by the AI system. And like in medical settings or legal settings, it's not like the ultimate arbiter typically these days is in the AI system. People are worried about that, and I don't think it, it takes some time to do that, to trust AI systems not to do so. So typically there's some decision maker, and the AI system can be used as a first step, some kind of, kind of culling or some, some form of initial decisions that can, or advice. Like I talked about in the, in the justice setting, right? So the, the 
recidivism prediction, get the score from something like Compass, and that's given to a judge, and the judge would be the decision maker. And so our work said, well, if that's the case, maybe we want to be smarter in this, uh, in this model, and the model should say, I don't know sometimes. So rather than, if it gives a judge a probability of 0.7, right, what is the judge supposed to make out of that? Right? A judge might you know, say 0.7 looks bigger than 0.5 to me, that's a yes, so the person's going to commit another violent crime. Right? Um, so the idea is that we want to, in a real world situation where people are going to use this, it might make more sense for the system to have three kinds of outputs. A yes, a no, and I don't know. Okay, so confidently yes, confidently no, and I don't know. So we call it the IDK model, or I don't know model. Get for every input, it can say a zero or a one or an I don't know, and then it gets passed on, and the decision maker gets to make decisions about the I don't know ones, and the and we'll say that the judge kind of uh, in this case would trust the model. Right? So it's a whole pipeline or a whole framework, and so now we're building a machine learning system, thinking about how it's actually being used in the real world. Okay, so that's some recent work that we've done, and there's some history of working in machine learning on something called learning to reject, which is this idea of saying I don't know, and just to convey uncertainty. You can imagine, like, you know, if the system is going to have a probability between, I don't know, 0.2 and 0.8, you could say I don't know, and it'll only say yes if it's, or no if it's 0 to 0.2, and yes if it's 0 0.8 to 0 0.1. Okay, so that's, you can imagine a system like that. That's called learning to reject, like that stuff. So what we prefer, what we propose is something that's a little better than that, we think, which is learning to defer. So that's an improved decisions about when it should say, I don't know, when this model can be trained in a way that it's aware of the downstream decision maker. So imagine the AI system knows something about the judge that's going to, you know, be looking at the probability that it produces. And if it knows about this judge, it can tailor its decisions and decide when to say, I don't know, based on that judge's leanings. Okay, so again, this is the idea in machine learning, maybe we have enough information about the decision maker that we can know the biases of that particular judge and adjust accordingly. All right, so that we call that learning to defer. And just to give you an idea of how that works, so we've tried this actually on the Compass data set. That data set is, is publicly available. And we wanted to say, could we do a better job where in the Compass data set, instead of giving out a score, we actually said, a, yes, they're going to reoffend. No, they're not going to reoffend, or I don't know. Okay, and then we had a model for a downstream decision maker, like a judge, that was making the decisions, and we wanted to take into account that judge's decisions in deciding when we were going to say I don't know. So we have these three systems. One of which is a system that is going to just say yes or no. So we call that a binary fair system. And we have two things that we're trying to trade off. One is the accuracy of the system. We want the system to be as accurate as possible, so as high as possible here. And disparate impact, that is the impact on the two groups. Okay, and disparate impact, in this case, was really about saying uh, it's a little subtler than what we were doing before. So let me just take a brief aside here. So disparate impact, if you remember, we talked about that was in the legal doctrine, is that the decisions couldn't be unfairly uh, or disproportionately uh, against one group. And so disparate impact, instead of statistical parity or demographic parity, which says the same number of yeses have to be assigned to the two groups, disparate impact is more like saying, we want to be as accurate as possible, but when the system makes mistakes, the mistakes should be balanced between the two groups. Okay? So it's not saying that overall how many yeses are assigned to the two groups has to be the same, but instead the mistakes should be balanced between the two groups. Okay? So that's a new definition of fairness that people have developed. It's also called equal, equalized odds or disparate impact. Okay? So that we've been using that as a measure of saying, okay, we hold out some test data, let's see how we do in terms of minimizing the disparate impact. So ideally we want to be up in this corner. We want the disparate impact to be close to zero, and we want the accuracy to be as high as possible. And you can see a system that doesn't care at all about uh, disparate impact is going to be, this is like a baseline. It's going to be about 70%. Okay? And now what we do is we say, uh, we do this rejection idea. We allow the system to say, I don't know, based on its un when it's not confident. And you can see that that increases the accuracy without affecting the disparate impact much. 
And the best one that we can do is the deferring one that's shown in red. And we get different points along this way here for different settings of the parameters and the model. So just don't worry about that. But the basic idea is that we're pushing towards this corner as we allow the system to defer. That is, it has some knowledge of the downstream of decision making. So we tried this out both on the compass data set and on the health data set and showed that it could get it some improvements by this deferring approach. And then we did some experiments to show how it could react to uh, the bias. So if you had um, a regular decision maker that was um, not was just ignoring the uh, underlying dimension, like uh, race, let's say, in the compass data set, versus one that was biased explicitly against race, okay, then if we def this is the kind of responses we got in terms of how many uh, how, how many I don't knows were being said both in the two cases when we had a biased or a, a decision maker or a standard decision maker. And what you can see is when we defer, that is when we have knowledge about that decision maker, it changes how much the system says I don't know. So that just shows you the sensitivity of the system when it has knowledge about and uses that knowledge about the downstream decision maker uh, in the deferring model. It can do it in a way that makes it more fair. Okay, so that's one bit of recent work. We just submitted that last week to the ICML, the big machine learning uh, meeting. And the other bit of work we did is uh, on what we call learning adversarially fair transferable representations. So that's a mouthful. That's a nice acronym that we can, what we like, it's called laughter. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, the system here is again, just like I said before, you have some X, you want to have some representation like we talked about before, and that representation Z is being used in the classifier. But now the way we train it up, we have this adversary in the loop. And the adversary is looking at the representation and trying to predict the sensitive variable. So now we switch the sensitive variable to A instead of S. But it's the same idea. It's trying to predict based on Z, what's the race of that person or what's the gender of that person. And we're using that adversary to make sure that we've removed as much information as we can about that dimension. Okay, so that's why it makes it an adversarially fair representation. And, and what you can find is that that ends up, we can use different definitions for what's fair. We could use the, disc, the um, uh, demographic parity. That's what this one is. That's the original one we had. We can use what's called equalized odds. That's the disparate impact, the one I was saying that instead of it being the output being balanced, this is the errors being balanced between the two groups. And there's another one called, that's equalized, opportunity, equalized odds, and there's equalized opportunity, which is just a slight twist on that. It's not too important. But the idea is that when we train the system to be optimized for one of these criteria, and then we test it, we find that it do the best on that. So in other words, if you train it to op optimize equalized odds, you get the best scores, the lowest scores in terms of the difference in the, uh, in the uh, assignments, the errors between the two groups. So you can see this one's bold, that's smaller than the others. When we train it to equalize opportunities, it does the best in terms of equalized opportunities at test time. Okay. Then the last result we have is about this transferability. So this is the final notion, which is that the, aim, the big picture here is that we're training up a system to create representations that are fair, that can then be handed off to vendors. And so the transferability part of it means that we're going to train it up on a bunch of different data sets. Then we're going to create this, data, this representation that we give to some new vendor that we haven't seen before. And that vendor is going to have their own task they want to do. They want to decide, you know, instead of low-fat chips, I don't know, they want to decide to market um, you know, some bit of clothing for this person. Okay? So we don't even know what this, what this vendor is doing. So it's, we want to be able to transfer the representation that we've trained up in these other tasks to some new task, okay? to some new vendor, some new classifier. So that's the, the transferability part of laughter. And, uh, and then we tested it up on the ability to transfer. In the health data set, we tried to transfer it to other classes. And what we found is that these are some other methods that we tried to see whether we build representations that could transfer in a fair way. And this is our current one. And what you see is that this is compared to a baseline we lose something in accuracy, so this is our accuracy has, has, is worse than it was before, so these are the errors compared to how it was before. But the other ones lose in terms of fairness, 
but this one gains a lot in terms of fairness relative to the, the baseline. Okay, so we were able to transfer it to new tasks. Okay, so, so then I'll wrap up. Um, so moving forward, the th one of the things that I said, remember our original definitions, we said there were two kinds of definitions for fairness. One was this group fairness. Originally we had one criteria that was this uh, demographic or statistical parity. And then more recently there was this equalized odds and disparate impact. But the first criteria we said was this individual fairness. We want similar individuals to be treated similarly. And the problem with that is we, you know, how do we capture that? I mean, that still is the ultimate goal, but it's very hard to define that. And so then our new work, what we want to do is return to that question and say, how can we, how can we capture that individual fairness? And so it's all about the metric. How do we decide two people are similar? Okay. Um, and typically it's done in some task specific way. It's based on some, you know, whatever it is, if you're similar in terms of your ability to get a loan. Right, if that's what your decision you're making. But ultimately, we don't want it to be too tied to a particular classification decision because we want these representations to transfer. Right? So we want it to capture some sort of ground truth or society's best approximation to that. And it should be open to public discussion and refinement. So we expect people to actually try to talk about this. And there's a number of examples where this is already being used in some way. So for financial risks or insurance risks, so like actuaries are doing this kind of thing all the time. You know, how similar are these two individuals? Right? Well, how risky are they? And this is done in a way that society doesn't have much or any input into. Right? And it's done in the health industry a lot. Right? We want to decide who is going to get some sort of expensive resource for a, I don't know, transplants or operations or things like that. Right? You want to treat similar patients similarly, what determines which patients are similar? And so this is a more general societal question that I think is important for fairness, but it's important uh, in, in general. In, the, you know, in philosophy, people have dealt with this quite a bit. And, uh, in economics, people have looked at it. Um, so, um, so basically, I wanted to conclude by saying we you know, even though machine learning is uh, more and more popular these days, I don't think we want to leave these decisions up to the algorithms. We want to have some societal input into it and specify the aims and criteria. And so I think of it, the machine learning person, the AI people, their job is to expose what's happening in the algorithm and make the algorithm sensitive to these things. So that if you come, do come up with a new definition, the algorithm can respond to that. And there are these inherent trade-offs Right? So we want to avoid some sort of bias, which is what the public might want to do uh, to make things fair versus the accuracy of the decision. And that's really about the vendors. The vendors want to maximize their own utility. And what do we do about this on an individual ba basis? And I, like I said, I think the bottom line for us is that we want to have some sort of definition and in, uh, in objectives that would be based on conversations with public policy and legal people. Um, and so what are the right goals? How do we formulate these objectives? So to wrap up, I want to thank all my collaborators. So the recent work was with a couple of grad students shown here in their musical talents, <laughs> uh, David Madras and Elliot Krieger, and uh, my colleague Tony Patassi who worked on the, the two methods I was talking about at the end there, the adversary laughter method and the I don't know method. Those are two recent papers that uh, we submitted to a conference. And the older work was done with some collaborators down here, Cynthia Dwork, Hugh Jilly, Kevin Sorsky, and Boogie. And that's it. Thanks.